speaking, but for this one, actually, today, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm, I'm actually speaking uh, in front of a field with some people who are actually titans in the field themselves. We have people in the audience who uh, did the first experiments with actual quantum computers. So, uh, and I'm really proud but nervous to be introducing another one of those uh, titans who um, I think I can um, really say without hyperbole is the founder of quantum computing algorithms and, and someone that I think all of us in the field really look up to um, as one of the people who was uh, prescient uh, in his thinking and, and theory before the theory became reality. So for many of you who uh, are not from the field uh, and, and, and haven't heard about uh, quantum computers, you probably uh, wouldn't have even been thinking of a quantum computer as a thing back in 1993. Um, because it didn't exist. It actually didn't exist. But the, uh, the professor we're going to um, hear from today, even in the context of not yet having one qubit working in 1993, was able to come up with the first algorithm for a computer that didn't even exist yet. Um, so that's a little bit of the context of the genius that we're going to have the pleasure of uh, hearing from today. And um, it, it's a great honor to be at my undergraduate uh, institute introducing uh, an applied master's degree in this field in front of some of the titans in the field who've come uh, to join this conference um, and hear a keynote lecture by uh, one who fundamentally was a founder of, of this field himself. Uh, not in the flesh, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, th this is due to where we are with, with, with COVID, unfortunately. Um, so Professor Bazirani uh, is the Roger A. Stouch Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley, um, and is the director of the Berkeley Quantum Computing Center. Um, he is a fellow of the Association of Computing Machinery, um, and he was awarded the Fulkerson Prize in 2012 for his work on graph separations. And he was also elected in 2018 to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, but above and beyond all of that, today we're here to talk about quantum computing and what it's going to do for us uh, as humanity. Um, and uh, he really did, uh, it was his uh, paper in 1993, I think, that, that uh, is, uh, you can't read a book that doesn't quote this uh, work on, on quantum complexity theory. And actually bringing mathematical rigor to something that was, well, uh, maybe, maybe we could use quantum physics to do something useful as a, as a thought this actually brought the mathematical rigor to say this could actually happen. It gave birth to the idea that we could have someday qubits. And now we live in a world where those actually do exist and they're starting to actually be used. And hopefully they'll be soon used to do things that our own classical computers that have decades of, uh, of history behind them cannot do and, and literally make what was once impossible possible. So with that, um, I, I, um, I, Seed to uh, Professor Vassarani. Um, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christopher, for that very kind introduction. Um, um, I'm really sorry not to be there in person. I. Um, you know, it's, it's, as Christopher said, the circumstances but that we live in today. Um, let me also say in terms, in terms of this public lecture, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm one, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that I really do that much of, but, um, but um, what I intend to do is follow, um, you know, uh, uh, one of my great heroes, uh, Richard Feynman, when he said, you know, I'll try not to tell you anything false. I might simplify things, but I, I'll try not to say anything false in this, in this lecture. So um, let me just share my screen and... Uh, uh, um. Okay, so, so let me start by, by providing the you know, sort of the, the perspective on where, where this, um, you know, where quantum computing actually um, starts from or where, you know, or, you know, a perspective on computing before, uh, before quantum computing. So, 
you know, if you go back, um, you know, there was this view of the of the mechanical universe that that had a profound uh, effect on our history, you know, in terms of the industrial revolution. And in fact, you know, in terms of physics all the way up to the early 20th century when there were these revolutions in terms of relativity and quantum mechanics. And, um, and in some sense, you know, I, I think one can say quite, quite um, you know, quite clearly that even though in the, in the early 20th century, there was this revolution in physics. And even though the theory of computing, you know, computers didn't come, up, come about until the, until the middle or, you know, the second half of the, of the 20th century, um, our entire computers, uh, conception of computers before quantum computers rested on this view of the mechanical universe. So let me, let me try to say in what sense this, this, uh, this is true. So, you know, all the way through, um, you know, up through the end of the 19th century with Maxwell's equations, you, you could say, you know, physics was working its way up to saying nature is described by local differential equations. So, you know, how should we think about it in terms of, in terms of computing? Well, we could, you know, what we could say is, what we can assume is, you know, let's, let's make an assumption that space is discrete and time is discrete. Now, of course, that's not how we think about it normally. But of course, we've never actually, you know, all, our, all the laws of physics are consistent with saying, well, space can be extremely tiny. You know, you can go to very tiny, uh, tiny lengths and you can go to very tiny uh, time intervals. But for all we know, once we get to small enough, um, um, you know, small enough intervals of time and small enough uh, parts of space, maybe it does become discrete. And then once you, once you assume that, then, then our, you know, we, we are really saying nature is described by, by a cellular automaton. So what's a cellular automaton? You know, you have, you have a bunch of cells, this is in two dimensions, but you would make that in three dimensions. Each cell can be in one of a small number of states. So in this case, either white or black, so just one of two states. And then there's some simple rule saying each, each cell sort of minds its own business and sits there only looking at the cells immediately surrounding it. And based on the state of those cells, it decides to do something. Okay, so all you have to do to describe the dynamics of the system is describe what a particular cell does when, you know, based on its neighborhood. And it's that same rule throughout, throughout this entire cellular automaton. Okay, so it takes only a finite amount to describe it. And this particular cellular automaton is due to John Conway, the famous uh, mathematician. Um, he actually passed away last year of COVID complications, but he was a he was a great figure, you know, really playful with his mathematics. And this is this is really a you know very uh, interesting cellular automaton he he created. It's called the game of life, where you know you think of these black squares as alive, and and a square if it has enough uh, black squares around it. Um, you know, springs to life. And if it has very few, then it, then it dies. And as you can see, you know, just this very simple rule can generate extremely interesting dynamics. And in fact, what he is able to show is that this is as powerful as any computer that you can have, right? It's universal, a universal cellular automaton. Okay, so, so now, once you realize this, you know, this is, this is stated, you know, this, this fact about, about, um, about computation, it, it forms the foundations of computer science. You know, this, uh, it's, it's called the extended shear string thesis. And it basically says any reasonable model of computation can be, you know, can be simulated on a, on a very simple model, which is called a Turing machine. And 
it, it can be efficiently simulated on that model. Okay. And the, the reason that we believed that was that, you know, we could say, well, look, nature is described by cellular automata and, and these cellular automata can be, uh, can be simulated by this, this very simplistic model called a Turing machine and named after Alan Turing, the great logician who invented them. And so that's where this thesis comes from. Now, it turns out that, you know, this, in this entire view of, of computers um, sort of gets totally challenged, challenged, challenged in a very profound way once you move to quantum mechanics. And so let me try to give you a sense of in what, you know, why it gets challenged and what's so fundamentally different about quantum mechanics. So, so you, you see back here, you have this notion of locality. What you see is what you get. You know, each part of space represents itself and, and it's doing something very locally. It doesn't, you know, there's nothing hidden from you. You know, everything happens right there and it's just looking at its local neighborhood as it, as it evolves its state. So the state of the universe is the state of all the, all the, all these uh, little pieces of space, and and how nature evolves is is just this, by this very simple rule. So now, what does quantum mechanics tell tell us? Well, quantum mechanics is sort of as extravagant as this theory is parsimonious. So in quantum mechanics, if you have a system of n particles, so think of n n as a few hundred. Right? So we are going to be modest in the system size that we are going to think of. Well, then quantum mechanics says that in order to understand how this system actually changes in time, you have to invoke an exponentially large number of helpers who are, who are sitting behind the scenes. So there's this exponentially large Hilbert space within which sits this exponentially large superposition. And somehow to know what these end particles are doing, you have to consult this hidden space that's, you know, we don't know, we don't even know where it is. Okay, so let me let me try to make this a little bit more, more clear. Okay, so let's start with, with the notion of a qubit or a quantum bit. Okay. So before that, let's say, let's say that we were de designing our computer at the you know, at the level of, uh, at, at the quantum level, you know, we, we try to make it smaller and smaller and smaller until it, until we, we, we think to ourselves, we want to represent a bit of information, zero or one by an electron. And let's say it's an electron in a hydrogen atom. So, so we think of this electron either as being in a ground state, a low energy state, or in an excited state, it's the first excited state. So that, so we, we think of the ground state as zero, and the electron in the excited state is one. So now, by the time we get down to the level of an electron, quantum effects start, start dominating. And in fact, we start realizing that, in fact, the electron can not just be in the ground or excited state, zero or one, but in general, it can be in a linear superposition of the ground and excited state. So what does this mean? Well, there's a complex amplitude, alpha, with which it's in the ground state and a complex amplitude beta with which it's in the excited state. Okay. Now, the, the thing that we insist upon is that the sum of the squares of alpha and beta, the squares of the magnitudes of alpha and beta is by one. So now what, is, what does it mean for it to be in, in the ground state with some amplitude and excited state with, with some amplitude? Well, you might think, well, obviously what it means is it's, it's in the ground state with some probability and the excited state with some probability. But no, you know, because, because these amplitudes can be negative and probabilities are never negative. In fact, they can even be imaginary. And so an example of, of the state of this, uh, this electron, of this qubit could be, you know, z ground state zero with, uh, with amplitude one over square root two and one, you know, this, uh, the qubit is zero with amplitude one over square root two and one with amplitude uh, minus i over square root two. Or let's just think of it as minus one over square root two. Now, 
Okay, so now what happens when we actually look at this electron? Well, when we look at this electron, it quickly makes up its, you know, it tells us, it tells us zero or one, and it says zero with probability alpha squared and one with amplitude, uh, probability beta squared. So it's great, the probabilities add up to one. So in this case, it would be zero with probability half, one with probability half. But now there's, here's, an, here's another new twist to quantum mechanics. What it says is, as soon as you measure it, the new state is exactly what you measured it to be. So if, if the outcome of the measurement was zero, your measurement disturbed the system enough that now the new state is actually exactly zero. Right? So if you measure it again, you'll just keep getting the same answer over and over again. You won't sample from this distribution over and over again. Okay. All right, that was, that was the story if you wanted to just store one bit. How about if you wanted to store two bits? Well, then we'd use two electrons. And now again, what quantum mechanics tells us is that the state of this system in general would be a superposition of the four possible classical states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And each would have their own private amplitudes. Now, of course, these, these again have to, have to be normalized in the same way that the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of these, of these complex numbers must be one. And again, if you go and measure the, the two electrons, you would see, say, zero, one with, with, with probability alpha zero, one magnitude squared. And again, as soon as you make the measurement, the actual state would be zero, one. So the first electron would be in the ground state and the second in the excited state. Okay, now what happens if you have n particles? So what if you have 500 such electrons, 500 hydrogen atoms and 500 electrons? So now the state of this, of this, um, uh, of these 500 qubits is in general, a superposition over all possible 500 bit strings. So 0, 0, 0, 500 times all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 500 times. Now, the interesting thing here is, of course, and, and of course, the sum of the squares of the amplitudes must add up to 1, as always. So the interesting thing here is that the number of 500 bit strings is 2 to the 500. And so, Somewhere behind the scenes, nature is keeping track of two to the 500 complex numbers. And that represents the state of this, this uh, 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 you know, this, these 500 uh, qubits. Now, the other thing that one can say is what happens, you know, what happens when you, when, when uh, you know, uh, as this system evolves? So maybe these, the, the, the two qubits that are highlighted here interact with each other. The two hydrogen atoms talk to each other and, and they change their state. So how does this, this look? Well, it turns out what happens is, is that, you know, the, the state of these, uh, you know, of, of, this, of these 500 qubits is given by this, these two to the 500 complex numbers, which, which you can write as a vector in this, in this two to the 500 dimensional Hilbert space. And when these two qubits talk to each other, that causes a rotation of this Hilbert space. So it, so it gets rotated in some way. And so these two to the 500, this two to the 500 dimensional complex vector gets, gets moved as this space is rotated which means that these two to the 500 complex numbers all get updated, you know, as you get these two hydrogen atoms just to interact with each other, right? So now let's think about, let's think about how, you know, not how nature does this because we, you know, we, you know that's, a, that's a much deeper question, but, but let's just ask, ask how much work did nature do in order to do this? Well, so let's just look at a simple estimate. Two to the 500 is larger than the number of elementary particles in the universe. Two to the 500 is, is larger than the age of the universe 
in femtoseconds. Actually, two to the 500 is larger than the product of these two numbers. So what that says is, if every elementary particle in the universe was a computer working at a phenomenally you know, fast uh, uh, rate, you know, faster than any of our known computers, well, then the age of the universe would not be enough for all these computers to do as much work as nature is doing just to keep this 500 hydrogen atom going. So this is the, you know, this, this is really the, the impulse behind trying to create quantum computers. If, you know, so, so in other words, the way to think about it is behind the nice user interface in your, on your laptop or in your desktop and the fancy graphics and so on, you know, if you look inside, there's a bunch of electronics, you know, wires and transistors and, and resistors and so on. And, and so a computer is just a way of getting nature to solve a problem of, your, of interest to you, right? And so once we look at how extravagant nature is at the quantum level, then the natural question is, shouldn't we be using, shouldn't that be where, what we use to design our computers? You know, that's where we should be tricking nature into solving problems of interest to us. That, you know, because that's where it's working. It's so hard or unimaginably hard. Okay, but there's a little bit of a rub here. So what's the rub? Well, you see, this part of nature is the part that's hidden from us. The way, you know, so this, this, this two to the 500 bit, bit vector, which is, this, which is this quantum state, is not something that we have direct access to. The only thing we have direct access to is these 500 hydrogen atoms and the 500 electrons in there. And when we measure these, these 500 electrons, we just, we just see 500 bits of information. So that's a very modest amount of information that we can get out at the end of the day. So we see, instead of the superposition over all 500 bit strings X, we just see one of these 500 bit strings X sampled with probability, the amplitude of X magnitude squared. And now once we actually make that measurement, the superposition collapses, the new state of the system is X, right? the, the classical 500 bit string. So it might seem that nature has hidden her tracks extremely well. You know, that, that behind the scenes, you know, it's working incredibly hard, but for all we know, you know, it was, it was just doing nothing much. And so this, this, was the, this was the real question, you know, this was the real conundrum at the heart of the power of quantum mechanics. Now, actually, you know, even this, this part was not realized until, until the early 80s, actually. So there was this beautiful paper by Richard Feynman called Simulating Physics on a Computer, where he said, you know, where he pointed out that there's this problem, you know, one of the most important things that we do with computers is actually simulate nature. And usually when we, when we mean simulate nature, we mean, you know, when we do uh, simulation, we are simulating classical physics. For example, when we are trying, you know, in, in designing a car or an airplane, there's, or any, you know, almost any product, there's an incredible amount of simulation that takes place. And so what Feynman pointed out is that if you want to do this simulation for a quantum system, it seems like we need exponential resources, right? Okay. And then he asked, is it inherent? Or is it possible that, that 
you know, the, the physicist just got a very particularly cumbersome description of nature. And maybe there's a, some other description of quantum, you know, of quantum mechanics that, um, that would, that would uh, show that you can do this simulation efficiently. Maybe there's a different algorithm that simulates it efficiently. Okay. And so um, I actually came across this paper. It, you know, it was, it, was, um, it was a little bit of a forgotten paper and I came across it in, in, in early nineties, uh, you know, when I was a young assistant professor. And once I saw the paper and realized how, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I just had to drop everything I was doing and, you know, start thinking about it. And so I started thinking about it with my, with my student, Ethan Bernstein. And um, um, what we did is, is we, um, you know, we did something that computer scientists do. So if you want to show that, you know, so, so we wanted to try to understand, you know, was this inherent? Was this an inherent property of quantum mechanics? Or could you simplify it? And one way you can show that you can't simplify something is by showing what's called a reduction in, in computer science, right? Which is, which is to say, well, the reason you can't simplify it is because it can do something very difficult for you. And so what we, what we ended up showing is that if we have access to a mythical quantum computer, then we can use it to solve a very difficult problem, which, which we call Fourier sampling. Okay, but now this by itself, you know, this seemed to suggest that maybe there was something, you know, something that quantum computers could do, which, which, which violate this extended chair string thesis. But to say that it, they, it, they really violate the extended chair string th thesis, you, you know, there was something else to do, not just show that this model, you know, can, can actually solve a problem that is much too hard for Turing machines to solve in efficiently, but also that, that this quantum computer, this model of a quantum computer is a reasonable model. And so there were two things that, that had to be shown to show that this, this was a reasonable model, that, that they are efficiently programmable and that they're also digital. And so we thought we had shown both of these things. And then, you know, after we, after we had already um, uh, submitted the paper to a conference and it had been accepted, we realized that our notion of digital wasn't quite adequate. And so, you know, this is one of these things that happens in science. You, you know, you, you've already written a paper and then you realize that maybe, maybe there's something wrong with it. And so, so then you, you spend a week or two hoping to, to, to fix it before you, before you announce, uh, you know, that you'd made an embarrassing error or an embarrassing oversight. And then, well, we managed to fix it. And we managed to show that in fact, you, you could uh, assume that it was digital. And so, you know, that showed that there was a, there was such a violation of the extended chair string thesis. Now, so, so that's one aspect of, of uh, you know, of, of uh, you know, of quantum computers that they, they actually enable you to solve something, you know, they violate this extended chair string thesis. There's a second aspect that you can think about which is, which is that, you know, you can, you can think of, um, you know, quantum mechanics as creating this, this veil that it hides quantum systems behind, you know, that, that the measurement axis, uh, axiom of quantum mechanics sort of says, if you have an n qubit system, you know, even though there's an exponential amount of information that, that's posited behind the scenes, that, um, you know, that, that we'll never ever obtain, you know, more than n bits of information about it. There's actually a theorem, you know, that's actually a theorem, but that, that we can never get a glimpse into, into the rest of the state in, in any way. And, um, you know, it's hard to argue with that. That's really a theorem in, about quantum mechanics. It's called Hollywood's theorem, but, but still, 
you know, one thing we realized is that, is that, you know, this possibility of doing these hard computations gives one, gives one a possibility of peering behind this veil in, in certain ways that you would have imagined naively was impossible. So for example, here, here's what we wrote at the time. Uh, you know, uh, so this is, this is something that, um, you know, uh, um, I talked about in, in, in all, you know, a lot, lot of my talks, but then we actually, I was actually surprised to see that we, we actually sat down and wrote it out formally uh, at the time. So we said, for example, one might naively argue that it's impossible to experimentally verify the experimental size of Hilbert space associated with a discrete quantum system, since any observation leads to a collapse of its superposition. However, an experiment demonstrating the exponential speed up offered by quantum computation over classical computation would establish that something like the exp exponentially large Hilbert space must exist, right? So we would, we would actually be, be you know, if we could do such an experiment, it would actually demonstrate that there is such a thing as this exponentially large Hilbert space behind the scenes that's steering the path of this of this uh, of this computation. And um, if you, um, uh, some of you may have seen that. Um, there was there was a lot of coverage of an experiment that was done by by Google uh, a year and a half or so ago, where where they uh, you know it said uh, that they had achieved quantum supremacy. So quantum supremacy is exactly this. It's a it's a it's a catchy phrase for you know showing this this exponential speed up over over any classical computation. And then of course. Um, you know, with, with this experiment, there came, you know, some controversy about, you know, was it really established? Was it not? And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there were, there were also classical, um, there was, there was, uh, 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 there were sort of demonstrations that, uh, that you could, uh, more recently that you could, uh, uh, you could duplicate the, the, uh, that calculation on a supercomputer, uh, you know, at the sizes that it was it was done, performed. But I'll you know let me address you know how one thinks about about all this and you know to what extent this has actually been 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 done, been achieved. Okay, so let me let me sort of continue with with my story. So. Uh, Probably the greatest quantum algorithm was, uh, you know, invented by Peter Shaw, um, yeah, the quantum factoring algorithm, which um, on input a number n finds its prime factorization quickly. Now this is a famous problem in in cryptography because the RSA crypto system is based on precisely the difficulty of solving this problem on a on on a regular computer. In fact, every time you 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 shop online, your your credit card information is being transmitted to the merchant using the RSA crypto system. So, so the fact that quantum computers would break this is is obviously a you know a very big uh, uh, you know it's a it's a very very important uh, 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 algorithm. Now. It's also the, you know, since it's such a simply described problem, it's also the simplest thing uh, in principle that you could use for, for an experiment, you know, for quantum supremacy, because you would sort of say, first create a challenge problem, you choose two large primes P and Q. You know, this is what you do when, you, when you're doing, uh, you know, exactly the problem that, you know, in, in the RSA crypto system. So, when you pick your public key in an RSA crypto system, which is probably done for you automatically, and you know it's um, then two large primes are picked, they are multiplied together to get the number n, and then this is very hard to break apart into the prime factors uh, classically. But you could just ask your quantum computer to factorize n and see if you get back p or q, and that's that's how you would do this. 
Now, uh, that's that's the conceptually simplest way to to achieve quantum supremacy. It's not the right, you know, it's not the practical way to do it, because even though we have, you know, small quantum computers today, they are very small, and 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 still quite noisy, and so it would take, you know, it's 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 going to take a long time before we get to quantum computers large enough so that they can implement this particular algorithm uh, for any sufficiently large sizes of uh, numbers. And so my, my former student, Scott Aronson, who, who has an incredible way with, uh, you know, with, with Bert said, well, uh, in, his, in his paper with Arkhipov said, well, proving a quantum system's computational power by, have, by integer factoring is, uh, it's a bit like uh, proving a dolphin's intelligence by teaching it to solve arithmetic problems. So what he meant was, you know, clearly you should be you should be doing something that quantum computers are natively good at, not not something that you have to program them to do this this uh, this carefully. And so that's exactly the approach that that Google used in their experiment. So it was it was a fifty two qubit. Uh, uh, processor that they use. Not all the not all the processors were working. So it may, you know, so not all the qubits were working. So it may have been maybe fifty one or smaller. So this this was sort of a diagram of the processor. You know, these uh, these are the qubits, the crosses, and these these are the programmable uh, you know uh, couplers which couple these qubits and makes make them inter interact with each other. But now, if you have if you have a fifty-two qubit uh, quantum computer, then you have a two to the fifty-two uh, dimensional vector behind the scenes. You know, so two to the fifty-two complex numbers, and two to the fifty-two is sort of you know it's it's in this Goldilocks uh, range. So it's uh, you know you want to pick n large enough so that two to the n is very impressive, but small enough that you can plausibly simulate things on a classical supercomputer, because that's what you needed in this experiment. And so what, what, did, what did this experiment actually consist of? Well, so, so what, they, what they did was fix a random, random quantum circuit. So they fixed, you know, of depth about 20. So what they fixed is how to program these couplers, you know, which, which of these qubits would couple to each other and how at time one, time two, time three, up to time 20, right? And they initialized the qubits all in the zero state. And then they, then they went ahead and, and you know, unfolded this, this sequence of, of couplings, you know, and after, after these 20 steps, they measured the output of these, of these uh, 52, let's, let's call it 52 qubits. And that was some, some output string X, so they recorded X and then they repeated the experiment. Repeated meaning initialized all the qubits to zero and then did exactly the same sequence of couplings over and over again, you know, the, uh, in 20 steps and then recorded another output. Now, why would it, it, it be another output? Why not X? Because it, they performed exactly the same steps. Well, because, because when, you, when you measure the output superposition, you see some X with probability alpha X squared it could be a different x each time. So now they get many samples. They sampled millions of times. And then they checked whether the samples were consistent with the output of the, of the actual quantum circuit, if, they, if, if it had been, you know, if that's what had occurred here. So now this is where, in order to understand what the actual quantum circuit would have done, they need to keep track of this. If they do it naively, they need to keep track of this two to the 52 dimension, you know, two to the 52 complex numbers. That's a bit too much to do, but using all the tricks that they could get, they still had to use sort of a supercomputer to figure out, you know, uh, the, answer, uh, the answer to this. Okay, so, so that was the experiment that they did. And, and what they were able to show is that, you know, there was there was just a tiny bit bit of uh, 
of a, of an answer in there. You know that that the answer looked almost random, except there was a tiny bit of signal, maybe uh, maybe something like uh, 0.2 percent. And then then there was there had to be an argument that this 0.2 percent signal that they seemed to be seeing was really was real, and it was not just something that happened to be there by chance or could have happened classically. And so how, how would you do this? So let me just explain to you, here, here's a cartoon depiction of the experiment. So you, you have your input, you know, which was all zeros. Here's your, you know, here's your, uh, here are your qubits. They are arranged in this, in this uh, square pattern. You have a classical computer that's com controlling all the, all the couplings between these qubits. And so after you initialize the qubits, you know, the classical con computer sort of controls the couplings for these 20 steps, you know, um, and, then, and then goes ahead and measures the output. And then you repeat this many, many times and check. In, and then you use a supercomputer to check whether this was consistent with the, the actual, uh, um, you know, quantum circuit that you programmed. In. And uh, and then here's here's the way to look at it, you know. So the so eventually you do some statistical analysis. So so if you think of the output of this this computer, the the quantum computer, as being you know it's it's sort of randomly saying things, right? So it's it's just a, it's just a randomly uttered speech. And what you're trying to tell in this experiment is. Does it speak with a quantum accent, or could it be, you know, could it be a, a classical computer that's actually speaking, you know, that's 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 creating these random-looking uh, utterances? Okay. So, so there were two two issues here with this experiment. One, it took exponential time to detect whether this this uh, this accent was plausibly quantum. This is why you needed the supercomputer, and you couldn't work with. Uh, many qubits, you know, so you could work with 20, 25 qubits, uh, you know, if you really wanted to tell and then using some tricks, you could sort of approximately guess and sort of say up to 50 qubits or something. Okay, so that's, that's what was done. Okay, and then you also have to say, do we know for certain that a classical computer couldn't have faked the accent that we actually heard, even, even though we took exponential time to to actually analyze it. And eventually the answer was, there's plausible evidence that, they, that a classical computer cannot. And this was due to work by, by uh, Aronson and Chen, and Aronson and Gunn. You know, Chen, you know, Chen was a grad, grad student at that time worked, working with Scott Aronson. Sam Gunn was an undergrad student working with uh, Scott at that time. He's now a grad student uh, working with me. And then with some of my, you know, the, there was work by some of my uh, postdocs, Adam Bulan, Bill Pfefferman, and student uh, Chinmay Nirke. So, you know, these, these were, you know, uh, this was evidence that you really cannot fake this accent, but, it, you know, there's still a lot of, lot of work to be done, both on the experimental side and on the side of showing definitively that this could not be faked classically. So you have to be able to, you know, that's a hard, hard thing because you have to say, no matter what, how you program your classical computer, you could not have done this. That's a, that's a tall ask, and that's that's sort of why it's such a, such a, uh, such a challenging thing to do. Okay, so so now you, you know, one can sort of say, why, you know, what's the motivation to try to try to, you know, if it's so challenging and it's sort of done, you know, what, why not leave well enough alone? And so the answer is that quantum supremacy is, it's not a one and done. It's, it's really an important scientific experiment in the following sense. Okay, so in the sense that in physics, we always want to test the limits of the theory. So we want to test the limits of physics in, in you know, we want to test physics in the, you know, it's, it's always, uh, so when physics has been tested in the limits of high energy, or at very small scales at the Planck scale, or at very large velocities, speed of light, something very fundamental has been revealed about physics when, we, when, when it's been tested at these limits. 
And so there's a new limit in which we get to test physics, quantum mechanics, which is in this test in this limit of high complexity, where, where the states themselves are highly entangled and involve a large number of qubits. And where, you know, this, this, this counterintuitive aspect of quantum mechanics comes to play, where, where you say, well, even if you have a system of 500 electrons, 500 qubits, the amount of work going on by nature behind the scenes is larger than what we can even conceive of classically in terms of the size of the universe, the age of the universe, all, all, these, all these enormous numbers that we can't even, can't even internalize. Right? And so, so one, one way to think about this uh, this experiment is, you know, there was a famous experiment uh, having to do with uh, Bell inequalities, you know, and, uh, you know, having to do with the entanglement of two particles that are separated over, over long distance. And, um, and this experiment has been, has been repeated, um, you know, over the decades, um, you know, over the last five decades until, until recently there were, there was there were this um, these so-called loophole free belt tests that were done, um, you know, as as people try to make them more and more convincing. And so, you know, I would imagine that the same thing is going to happen with this this particular experiment, that that we are going to get better and better guarantees, both uh, through advances in terms of experiments as well as advances in computational complexity of saying that. Here's an experiment that no classical computer could possibly, possibly duplicate. Okay, so, so now very briefly, let me, um, let me just say, say a little bit about, um, about how one might go beyond this Goldilocks limit. You know, how do we, you know, so this, this form of the experiment required that the number of qubits is not too large because you have to have, have a, supercomputer working full time to even get up to you know 20 30 qubits and then heuristically a little beyond that so how do we go beyond that so so it seems like a really daunting task because you know we are in the in this position you know of a classical verifier looking on at this quantum computer that that gives away, you know, it's very laconic. It barely gives away any, any information at all about what's going on inside. But then also what's going on inside is exponentially powerful. So how would we, you know, how do we ever get to interact with, with it in a, in a meaningful way and, and test it? So somehow, you know, this, this would be a scenario that would be more equitable, but of course that's not the case. So, so the one thing that can come to our, you know, can we, we could try to use is the fact that even though quantum computers are exponentially powerful, they're not all powerful in the sense that they're exponentially powerful on certain tasks. So remember that even though nature is working exponentially hard behind the scenes, nature is also hiding her tracks and sort of pretending not much happened, right? And, and so there, there, there are certain problems where you don't really get an advantage through quantum computation. So for example, the RSA crypto system was broken, but now there are new crypto systems that have been designed, which have the property that you can actually, actually implement them classically, but it's, it's going to be exponentially hard for even a quantum computer to break, break them. Right, so this is the ongoing subject of, of a NIST challenge. You know, they are, they are getting ready to, to, uh, to announce standards for this new post-quantum cryptography, which is going to be rolled out in, you know, for, for, for the most uh, uh, critical uh, applications over the next, next few years, and then, then gradually for all applications. Okay, so this has, so now if you use one of these post quantum crypto systems, then if you have the secret key, then you can decrypt messages that even a quantum computer cannot. So now this seems to be, you know, that seems to be something that one, one might be able to use. 
So now how could you use it to level the playing field? So there's a wrong way to do it, which would be to cripple the quantum computer by forcing it to play on, on this turf that the classical verifier is, is, you know, has an advantage. Because that would be counterproductive because then, then you don't get to enjoy the, the uh, you know, uh, all, all the abilities of the quantum computer. So the right way is to make the quantum computer play on turf where, where the verifier has some advantage, but also while allowing the quantum computer to do, you know, to actually exercise its unique computational capabilities. Right, so, so how do we do this? Well, it turns out that, okay, so this is something that we did with, uh, with uh, uh, my, my students, Paul, Cristiano, Urmila Mahadev, uh, Thomas Vedek, who was my former student then, and also a researcher from, uh, from Israel, Zvika Brakersky. So what, what, what we managed to do was to show how to use this post-quantum cryptography to get the quantum computer to create a quantum bit so this is just a single quantum bit. It's in a superposition of zero and one. It's either an equal superposition of zero and one. If B is zero, then B is a bit zero or one. So it's either one over square root to zero plus one over square root to one, or it's one over square root to zero minus one over square root to one. Which one? Well, it's random, 50-50. And it turns out that if you have a quantum bit in this state, then you cannot distinguish it from a completely random bit. There's absolutely no information to be had about what this quantum bit is. But it turns out that the quantum computer can not only prepare this quantum bit, it also knows the encryption of, of this bit B using this post-quantum crypto system. And so it can actually communicate this encryption of this bit B to the classical verifier. So now you have these, you know, this, this exponentially powerful quantum computer that has prepared this quantum bit, but it has no idea what the quantum bit is. And this much weaker, you know, this classical verifier who can figure out what this bit B is and so who knows exactly what this quantum bit is but it of course has no ability to create or manipulate these quantum bits. Okay. And so once you have this, you know, this is sort of a new kind of probe of Hilbert space. You can reach inside this Hilbert space and say, even though, you know, even though I don't trust what's going on in there, I know exact, I can actually know exactly what's going on in there. Okay, so now, let me just say this for for two seconds, and then you know this is this is sort of the maybe the one of the few pieces of uh, technicality here. So what what kind of cryptography do we use? So you know usually you have an encryption function. You take a message, you encrypt it, and from the from the encrypted message you can recover the uh, the, the original message. So. What we do instead is use use a two to one function. So they are they are always if you have a message x naught which which encrypts to y, then there's another message x one that also encrypts to y. Okay, so these messages come in pairs, and the property of this encryption function is that you cannot ever find the pair. It, you know, it's it takes an cl classically or quantumly, it's very hard to find find a pair of messages that encrypt to this the same value. Okay, so that's called a claw. Okay, so, so we'll use this kind of, of post-quantum cryptography where, where, you, where you have this collision between two messages, you know, always. And so, so now let me, let me say one other quantum principle that we are going to be using, which, you know, which is sort of one of the most basic principles of quantum mechanics, uh, if, if you, you know, which is, uh, if you've seen the double slit experiment or the quantum version of it, where where you have a single electron that's, you know, that's being transmitted, it goes through one of two slits. And then if both slits are open, it creates an interference pattern here. So you have light patches and dark patches, which you explain by the fact that the light interferes with itself. 
But now if there's a single, elect single photon, then it either goes through this slit or that slit. And then how does the interference happen? Well, you know, that's, that's how you sort of say that the photon must have been in superposition. You know, part of the amplitude, it went through here and part through here. But now there's one other aspect of this experiment that's quite important, which is in quantum mechanics, you cannot talk about the trajectory of the electron. You see, because, because if, you, if you are too, you know, if you're too curious about how did the photon, sorry, of the photon, how did the photon get from here to there? If, you, if you're curious, did it go through this first slit or the second slit? As soon as you start tracing the trajectory, then the quantum effects disappear and the interference pattern disappears. And you, it, you know, it's as though the photon probabilistically with 50% probability went through here and 50% through here. And you, you, don't, you don't see the quantum interference pattern. So, so in quantum mechanics, you don't get to ask what the trajectory of the, of the photon was or of the system was as it, as it went through. You only, you have to keep it as a black box and you measure when you measure. So now let's, let's look at this protocol that we have and let's try to understand, uh, you know, I'll just explain it at a high level, how it, how it works and, and, and why it works. So you first, you know, so as a, as a classical verifier, you just say what this function is, you know, what this encryption function is to the, to the quantum computer, and then it uses it. And, and it, it now commits to a random Y, you know, an encryption of a message. Now, remember when it encrypts a message, it's, uh, it's, it's the encryption of two different messages, X0 and X1, okay? But it's very hard to find both X0 and X1, either quantumly or classically. So we know that this quantum computer also doesn't know both messages. So then we challenge the quantum computer to say one of two things. You know, we, we challenge it either to provide us with, with a message, in which case it, it returns X, which is either X0 or X1. It'll tell us X0 or X1, 50-50 probability, and we can check that it, it told us what it was. The other thing it can do quantumly is it can give us an equation, a bit, a bit of information jointly about X0 and X1. Okay, and this is a, you know, it gives us back an n-bit string, which, which is some, which, which gives us some connection between X0 and X1. And this connection also we can verify efficiently because we, we you know, since we have the decryption key, we can, we know both X0 and X1 once we are given Y and we can check. Okay, so now here's the interesting thing. A quantum computer can, uh, can answer either challenge. You know, you ask whichever one you want, it'll answer you. But no classical or cl quantum computer can efficiently answer both challenges, okay? So it might seem the situation is completely symmetrical in quantum and classical uh, computers. But now what we are going to argue is because of this second fact, in fact, no classical computer can reliably answer either challenge. Okay. And the reason is that a classical computer, if, it, if, it's, if it's willing to answer either challenge, in fact, it must have the ability to answer both. And the way you see that is you run this protocol, you know, as, as, as we said, you know, all the way. So you, you get the first challenge, you get back X. Okay. Now what you do is, since this is a classical computer, you can rewind it. You can reset it to the state it was in just after it, it sent Y. It committed to Y. And now, now that you've rewound it, you give it the other challenge, right? You change your mind and say, I want the equation. And so now it must send you back, since it's cl classical, it's in, that, it's in that state, it's going to send you back the equation. And now you have both, both X and this equation. In fact, what, what we can show is that once you have both of these, you can figure out both X naught and X one, and therefore you break the, you know, and that's impossible from this, this thing. 
Okay, so what we made use of is exactly this, this, this notion that, that, so the reason the quantum computer can answer either challenge is because the quantum computer, you cannot ask for its trajectory. You cannot ever rewind it. And somehow that plays a crucial role in this ability. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip over how, you know, how this works. I was, I was going to just say a couple of words about it, but I, I think I'll, I'll just skip over it. Let me just say that, um, you know, the same protocol actually allows you to do something else. It allows you to actually uh, create certifiable quantum random number, uh, numbers. What this means is the following. So, you, you know, you, we know that, uh, you know, there's this, there's this whole thing with, with quantum mechanics. The, you know, the Einstein had this issue with it. You know, the universe doesn't, God doesn't play dice with the universe, but, you know, the fact that quantum systems generate randomness. But if you want to generate reliable randomness, that's a different thing because one, you have to keep calibrating the system. Two, if you want it for cryptographic purposes, then you, you, have, to, you have to trust the system. And so how would you actually, if it was an untrusted system, can you generate real randomness from it? And so with this protocol, what you can, what you can do is you can actually generate statistically random bits. Um, if you start with a very tiny number of truly random bits to start with, and then the tests actually certify that this particular output string must be random, must be statistically random. So this is actually quite, it's, it's something that, that um, you know, if you think about, it's something that you can't even possibly achieve classically. You know, uh, it's, um, and, you know, this is sort of this, you know, it, it, in precisely the sense that this Dilbert cartoon captures actually. Um, now, um, um, this, you know, this, uh, uh, this primitive, you know, of, of being able to reach into the Hilbert space and get the quantum computer to create this qubit was actually used by my student, uh, Urmila Mahadev, um, to solve two other very, very fundamental problems. One is, you know, quantum computers are expected to be in the cloud. Uh, for you know, at least initially, and maybe maybe even into the into the, you know for a long time, and so you might want to keep your data private while delegating your computation to it. So how would you do this? You know how would how can you do this? Uh, can you encrypt your data and still have a quantum computer compute on that data? So so she gave a scheme for doing this based on based on these sorts of. Uh, um, these sorts of uh, considerations. The other question was, suppose that your quantum computer finishes doing some, some, uh, some calculation and it gives you an answer. Um, how do you actually know, how would you trust it? You know, how would you know that it got the correct answer? Um, or how, how, how do you know that it didn't make a mistake along the way uh, or that the quantum computer was faulty? So you can, you know, you can actually come up with a scheme for verifying that, you know, getting it to prove to you that it actually gave you the correct answer. Okay, so um, actually both of these, uh, you know, the, the, um, the certifiable randomness and, and this, these um, verification of quantum computation, they are, they are very nice readable articles in, uh, in, in the Quanta magazine, which by the way, if you, if you do not consult you should because it's one of the one of the great places for um, for sort of reading about science at a popular level in you know where it's where it's really uh, usually extremely accurately portrayed. Okay, so um, so let me let me wrap up here. So um, so le let me say that um, you know quantum computation is much more than about about uh, being able to calculate, you know, solve problems faster. It actually represents a big change in perspective, you know, in, in our thinking. So it's, it's a catching up with 
you know, so so there, there there was a change in perspective going from the mechanical universe to to incorporating these new ideas about new meaning a century old ideas about you know how the world behaves. But but once these got incorporated into a computational way of thinking, it actually you know they've had a profound effect on on not just on computation but on physics itself. So. Uh, you know, in how condensed matter physics is done, you know, in, in the kinds of questions that they ask have changed dramatically through, through uh, you know, through the study of entanglement and quantum error correcting codes and so on. And even the study of quantum gravity has undergone a revolution now through these ideas from quantum computing and quantum information. Now, the other thing I should say is that, is that even though quantum computing, you know, as a field, you know, goes back over a quarter century, for the majority of it, it's been, you know, it's been sort of dealt with on a theoretical level. Even the experiments were, you know, these really uh, much smaller scale experiments until very recently. And, and we should really think of it as, as a field in its infancy, you know, it, there, are, there are major challenges that lie ahead in all its aspects, including experiments, algorithms, applications, you know, all, all of these. So, so it's, it's a field with this incredible potential, but there's, there, you know, it's something that we are going to see unfold over these, over these years. Um, there's a very nice, uh, uh, there's a there's a very nice quote by my you know my former student uh, Jordan Karnidis who works in quantum machine learning, and he said that about quantum machine learning that it's a it's a it's a field that's overhyped and underestimated. So you know that's that's a I I, I always like this way of looking at things. Um, the third thing is testing quantum mechanics in, in the limit of high complexity. It's an experiment, as I said, that'll be repeated over the next few next years and possibly decades. I think it's a fundamental experiment. And one last thing that I should say, you know, this extended church during thesis, you know, I described it to you from the physical viewpoint. There, you know, where, where we say efficient computation, this represents what the universe, what you can do in the universe. This is what nature does in the universe. There was another motivation for the extended church Turing thesis, uh, because after all, Church and Turing were both logicians. And so they were thinking about, well, a Turing machine describes the set of functions that are humanly computable. So Turing was maybe thinking about a mathematician sitting down with, a, with an unlimited supply of paper and an unlimited supply of pencils and, you know, what can you do with it? Okay. And so, and of course, these two notions coincided, you know, when, as long as we were thinking about classical computers. But now these two notions have diverged because when we think about nature, the class of, you know, that, that can be computed is classical. Oh, is is quantum? It's quantum. You know, that's that's what we can do, and you know, as and that's what where we are trying to get to. Humanly, well, so, you know, we we still think about you know if we are thinking, you know, our brains are as far as we know these are these are we can the, the, these do classical com computations. So what we can think of is really class what we can do with classical Turing machines. And so now, you know, this is another sense in which we have, we have a real revolution in terms of what we can think of versus what can be computed for us. Okay, so uh, with that, um, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rosani. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, first, I guess, from the audience here. Thank you very much. That was a very thought-provoking talk. 
I'm wondering about uh, Gerard Tohoff's model for quantum mechanics, where he uses cellular automata to represent quantum mechanics and says that it's all linked together from the very beginning of the Big Bang because all the particles were next to each other and everything's been essentially done uh, mechanically. I'm sorry, whose uh, who's model did you say? Gerard Tohoff. Oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, I... Um... Yeah, so, um, and, uh, okay, so, um, um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally qualified to talk to, uh, you know, speak to what, what he, what he says, but, uh, but, you know, um, I, I think, um, um, I think quantum cellular automata, you know, this is, this is, uh, um, you know, it's an it's an interesting topic, and you know, it, both in terms of uh, um, uh, you know what you can compute and whether you can you know to what extent uh, you can make make it. Uh, 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 you know, you have to work pretty hard to make the make them fault tolerant and so on, but um, but. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I sort of, I slightly missed, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, but the, but the quantum cellular automata, automata model, it still, it still shares the same property that if you want to, um, you know, if you want to understand what it does, you know, as it, as it steps through the computation, there's still a Hilbert space associated with it in the backdrop. And, um, it's still exponentially large compared to the, you know, uh, uh, compared to the cellular automaton. So it doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, change matters as far as uh, as far as everything we spoke about. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm just going to ask maybe a simple question from the perspective of engineering. So if you try to solve a turbulence problem, so you solve the Navier Stokes doing direct numerical simulation. So you could do a, a small box of, uh, of fluid at a not a very high Reynolds number. Is it, where where are we? What what time frame are we to be able to do something like that on a quantum computer that would be interesting for lots of applications? It just from a very practical perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. So, so you know, the the thing with with quantum computing is that um, you have to select your targets very uh, judiciously. You know, so um, so. Um, uh, for, for example, with, with the Navier-Stokes equation, we don't know, you know, we don't know whether, um, whether, the, whether the process can be sped up by, by a quantum computer, right? So it, it could be that it can, you know, it might be that it can be sped up a lot, or it could be that it's, it's a little bit more like this, the post-quantum cryptography that I, that I described, which is where, where there's something that um, you really cannot speed up uh, quantumly. And then there, there, are, there are these other problems where you cannot speed them up more generally, you know, you cannot speed up the general problem, but there's a piece of it that you can speed up a lot, right? And so, so then you use your quantum computer as a coprocessor and you, you solve the parts that you cannot speed up, you solve on a classical computer and you bite off a piece that you, you know, that you solve much more quickly. And so, um, so, you know, so when I said that there's a lot of work to be done on on all fronts, you know, both both in terms of scaling up the size of uh, size of the actual hardware and the number of qubits and their reliability, but also on the algorithmic front and on the applications front. So this would be what what I would think of as the applications front, where we'd be not just designing algorithms, but then saying, okay, now armed with this array of algorithms, which parts of it, you know, which of these can I actually, if, if my application is Nav Navier-Stokes, which part of that can actually be mapped to those, those algorithms? I 
think I can ask uh, one question myself uh, about this targeting, maybe building on that. Uh, you mentioned that some of your students have moved into this merging field of quantum machine learning, so adding some kind of use of this um, this uh, enhanced Hilbert space, if you will, that we can access uh, through this magic uh, in the area of machine learning. However, a lot of the targets of machine learning practically uh, deal with classical data. The mm -hmm. data that we're trying to discern distances from in the latent space or whatnot are classical. And, and, and it's not clear whether uh, or at least there's some debate that I'm hearing, uh, whether or not um, there can be an advantage uh, when the target problem set itself doesn't deal with something that is in itself, uh, to Professor Feynman's uh, 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 talking point, uh, like nature, that it is quantum. Yeah. Is there some way that this, this superset of dimensionality that we're able to access in, in that magic black box able to discern something even in purely classical data. Where is your intuition on this and where is your, uh, your, yeah. are your students' intuitions on this area? Yeah, no, this is a, this is a very, uh, very important point and it's a central point. Um, um, you know, this is called the data bottleneck and, and um, you know, obviously the amount of data one deals with classically is extremely large often, you know, when one's doing machine learning. And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, so so there are there are sort of two two answers to it. You know, one is that you know ultimately one might hope that one can one can use something called a QRAM to take this classical data and and put it into quantum form. You know, uh, create a, a sort of a, a, a quantum synopsis of it on on a small number of qubits and use that to to work with. Um, that you know, uh, that's possible in principle, but you know, it's it's um, it's uh, you you'd have to be very optimistic to say that that's you know that's that's not going to be sort of a late um, uh, development, but it's not ruled out. Um, I think the the more important the the better way to think about it is that. There is this um, approach where you uh, call sketching, where you have a large amount of data and then you create a small sketch of it. You, there are these techniques called, you know, of randomly creating a small synopsis of the data. And then this is used by the way classically as well. So often you, you, want, you want to take a large data set, create a small classical sketch of it. And then, then you have a core computational problem that you're trying to solve on it. And then, then you you take a classical algorithm and you work work on that core synops synopsis, and so so there are, you know uh, that would be that would be an approach towards uh, towards doing this. But you know it's it's all uh, I, I think I think that uh, uh, you know uh, this this is this is an area where where there's a you know, on the one hand, there's this, there's this incredible potential in terms of all this computing power. On the other hand, it's far from clear that, you know, what, what you can actually achieve. So it's, this is all right for research. And it's, uh, you know, uh, um, and, you know, the most interesting research is where, where you don't know what, the ans what which answer to expect, but, uh, but uh, or, or what, what the most interesting techniques are going to be. And, you know, this is the sense in which I, you know, I was saying that we, this is really a field in its infancy. Now, one one other thing that keeps it, in, you know, so if if you look at a lot of the machine learning work that's that's done, you know, a lot of a great deal of it is is uh, um, you know is uh, 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 is is um, is sort of done through simulation. You know, you you it's you you cannot theoretically an analyze many of the algorithms so for, for example deep nets which have taken off so you know have, have been profoundly uh, um, uh, you know effective uh, you know for, for the longest time they they didn't seem to you know people were working on it for a very long time and then you know once you could get to large enough instances enough data you know they, they started kicking in and so um, you know uh, there, there is really a question, you know, uh, um, 
the, the, you know, people are going to be trying very hard to explore these, uh, these areas theoretically for the time being uh, with some simulations, you know, possibly classical simulations or small scale quantum simulations. But then as the hardware starts, um, you know, uh, starts getting larger, maybe there'd be more, more of a, you know, uh, uh, you know, more uh, uh, ability to actually, actually experiment. But of course, you know, any experiments one does has have, have to be guided by physical or computational intuition. And so, you know, so, uh, so that's, that's where we stand. should ask uh, one capstone question. Uh, we're at URI starting a four plus one uh, master's program in this field. And so would you have to, you know, a, a junior or senior in high school, maybe a message about the, the optimism or potential of the field that, that might even convince them to, to go into this field? Cautionary caveats included, perhaps. Yeah, so... Um... You know, to to my mind, this is this is this is an absolutely you know it's an it's an incredible field, because you know on the you know so often the the most interesting activity happens at the at the boundaries between thing you know uh, you know you you have you have um, you know large. Uh, you know, you, you, you have these large bodies of knowledge that collide. And in that collision, you have, you have an incredible uh, sort of flowering of, of knowledge and, you know, and insights. And, and that's what's happening here, you know, so, so it's happening in, in multiple ways. So intellectually, it's just, it's just an incredible playground, both on the physics side and on the computer science side. And, you know, on the physics side, even if you weren't interested in quantum computing, it's an incredible playground. On the computing side, even if you were not interested in quantum computing, you can you you have these new insights and ideas that can that can be applied to classical computers, and that's not even taking into account, you know, the fact that cryptography is going to be revolutionized because we are going to have to roll out these post quantum crypto systems. And then there's the entire potential of quantum computers and, and building them and, and programming them and you know, creating programming languages and compilers and then algorithms and applications for them. So this is, you know, it's, it's really an, an incredible playground. And, and uh, you know, what's, what's, what's even more remarkable about it is that not only does it have all these beautiful aspects intellectually, but it's even, you know, it's even something that, that is, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, it's eye catching, you know, you can talk about it to, uh, to people, you know, people want to fund it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to, you know, it's hard not to like it. It's hard not to love it. So we do have a question from a remote participant. And the question that they asked is, do you expect for quantum computers to replace classical computers or will they end up more like an accelerator that users sometimes tap into? And then they have a second half of that question, which is what kind of questions are better suited for classical computers versus quantum computers? Yeah, um, so, you know, very definitely, you know, as I, I, I think, um, as I already alluded to, you know, that um, not everything can be sped up by a quantum computer and that, um, you know, that there, there might be the, in, in general, one might, um, you know, um, there might be some tasks that are sped up. Yes, there are tasks that may not be sped up and there might be some tasks where you can sort of, uh, bite off a piece that that you can that you can uh, allocate to a quantum uh, computer but then there there are going to be other parts that are going to have to be solved by a classical computer now this is this is not even taking into account the 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 sort of cartoon of the quantum experiment that i've shown you where you have your qubits and then there's a classical computer that's actually controlling them so so in fact even if even if you were going to solve a 
problem purely by, by a quantum computer. In fact, you should know that there's a classical computer sitting in there directing traffic and you know, issuing commands and so on. So it's, it's really built into the picture. I was intrigued by your comment that the um, that we might not be able to speed up uh, Navier-Stokes equations, for example, and and I was wondering if that's the same as saying that when you get down to a a small enough spatial scale, um, there's no difference basically in looking at it at different scales. Uh, it, is it a scale question or is it a time question? Or the, and how different are they? Yeah. Um... Um, yeah, sorry. So, you know, I, I should say that I, I, I know, you know, I'm certainly no expert on Navier-Stokes. I've, you know, I've, I've only looked at it, uh, you know, a couple of times, uh, you know, a little bit. Um, um, you know, I had a postdoc, uh, Paul Valiant, who, 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 was, uh, who was thinking about it quite a bit on his own time, you know, trying to, trying to speed up speed it up classically actually most mostly but um, um, you know but but the scale inv invariance I, I would say that that's that's not uh, that's not the reason I would say that um, uh, you know uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure I know enough about it to to conjecture that it can't be sped up quantumly it's it's just that um, you know the the way I'd look at it is that um, in order to say that something would be sped up, I, I need to see the kind of structure that that admits quantum algorithms. And so, you know, either in the in the problem as a whole, or then you know somehow taking it apart and saying, okay, here's a here's a core of the problem, and maybe you know maybe this piece we can speed up, and then the rest we can sort of uh, uh, sort of. Uh, you know the classical computers might also be able to do fast. So, so I, I, I don't know what the answer. So, so the true answer was should have been I don't know. But you know, I was sort of saying, well, if I don't know, then I shouldn't say that it can be sped up. So, another um, remote question we have for you, and this question asks about: Do you foresee a window of time where the NISQ will reach working on real-world? problems before they are overtaken by error correcting QCs. Okay, so the, the, the question is uh, asking, so, so there's current, um, you know, so, so these current quantum computers at um, how many, you know, many tens of qubits, um, they don't rely on quantum error correction. So as, as the size of quantum computers scale, we are going to have to use error correction. And um, and um, um, you know, so so that we can reliably do quantum quantum computing. And so the question is, before we and so there's overhead in error correction. So so the scaling would have to go to you know a large number of qubits before we get there. So the question is, what about in the meantime? You know, can we? Is is there a chance we might get to get to real world quantum uh, you know uh, problems? And um, uh, um, so, so I think that the, the um, um, you know, so, so currently the, the kinds of questions that are being targeted are, have to do with physics, you know, um, physics simulations and, and answering questions in, in certain physical sit situations, or maybe, Possibly even answering questions about quantum about materials, and um, so these I would see as you know uh, as real world problems in the sense that um, um, you know understanding those things would affect the real world. Uh, I wouldn't say real world in the sense that um, it's something that you would use in your in your daily life in any way at all, right? So it's not it's not the kinds of computational problems you'd be thinking of. Uh, uh, in that sense, but it could be it could be uh, extremely hard physical simulations or understanding phase transitions or things like that. So we have more questions rolling in from our online subset. So this is a little bit of a longer question, but I think it's a very good one. 
Um, and the question goes, so despite Scott and um, Aronson's, excuse me, typically amusing quote about dolphins, there doesn't seem to be anything fundamentally quantum about prime factorization. So unlike the quantum gate example from Google, that seems like a classical problem that admits a quantum algorithm. Is there something special about prime factorization compared to other cryptology techniques, such as elliptical curves? Well, uh, actually, uh, actually, um, it turns out that um, even uh, elliptic curve cryptography uh, you can break using quantum computers. So, so both of them have the kind of algebraic structure that. Um, you know that that um, that you can map onto quantum quantum algorithms very effectively, but um, but you need some some kind of structure that you know that that you can map uh, map into the sorts of things that. Uh, so essentially, the the issue is this. You know, so so nature works extremely hard behind the scenes, but then there's this packaging of an answer. You know, so so. Uh, there, there's we are only letting on a very tiny part of the part, part of the story, and so whatever slips through that that tiny window, you know that's that's what we are relying on. And so if we can map a problem onto you know if we can get it through the window into into that space, you know have nature work on it and then fit the answer through this tiny window. That's when that's when we get a win, and so that's that's the whole uh, challenge. Yeah. Thank you, and I think we're we're kind of at our end here uh, with your time. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vajrani, for uh, spending your time here and hopefully helping to inspire not only us in in the room here, other people online, and and maybe uh, usher in a, a new generation of people thinking about these uh, problems uh, uh, going forward. Um, thank you so much, and and let's give a, a big round of applause. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure.